This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Hi, everybody. Welcome into another episode of the Bartholomew Town Podcast. I'm Bill Bartholomew. Today, we return to our Inside Rhode Island Public Health Series presented by Commonwealth Care Alliance Rhode Island with a conversation on monkeypox, specifically vaccine availability here in Rhode Island, as well as what to do if you or someone you know are presenting with any of the symptoms of monkeypox. This is an effort to inform and educate you guys about options that are out there in terms of vaccines, in terms of, you know, what to expect if you present with symptoms, if you were in close contact with somebody who is positive for monkeypox, and just kind of wrap our heads around this thing that is, you know, filled with a lot of misinformation and, and so on and so forth. But here in Rhode Island, you know, it's clear from our conversation with Dr. Nunn that there are still, you know, challenges in terms of the public health response, but there is infrastructure in place. There is vaccine available here in Rhode Island, and it's available to those who are a part of, or I guess identify within several specific categories. So we'll get to all of that today here on the podcast. If you have a question about this, feel free to email me, bill at ripodcast.com, and I can pass it on to Dr. Nunn and uh, her office over at Open Door Health. Inside Rhode Island Public Health is brought to you by Commonwealth Care Alliance Rhode Island. Commonwealth Care Alliance, or CCA, is a multi-state integrated care system influencing innovative models of complex care nationwide. CCA's Uncommon Care model focuses on sustainable and evidence-based healthcare breakthroughs that improve the health and well-being of people with significant needs, and is consistently recognized as one of the best models in the country at identifying and serving traditionally hard-to-reach individuals. CCA is excited to bring Uncommon Care to Rhode Islanders with a range of Medicare Advantage plans. To learn more, visit www.commonwealthcarealliance.org backslash Rhode Island. All right, so Dr. Amy Nunn, who has been on the program many times before, welcoming welcoming you back here. Today we have a topic that has been, look, I mean, it's it's materialized over the last several months, it feels, and certainly in recent times, it's become much more of a mainstream conversation, and that's monkeypox and specifically vaccine and opportunities to obtain vaccine for certain people. So let's start with, you know, just kind of set the table for where we are today from just a general public health standpoint with monkeypox here in Rhode Island. Well, we've had about uh, 26 cases in the state um, as of uh, this morning. Those are the data that have been reported by the health department to the CDC. And uh, it's worth mentioning our neighboring states as well, just because we are so interconnected with Massachusetts and Connecticut, where they've had 134 and 39 cases. Uh, It's it's also worth noting that these numbers have about tripled in the last two weeks. So what we're seeing is that this is um, spreading quickly, and it's, it's something that's not completely well understood yet but it's certainly um, causing a lot of concern in the public health community. So, you know, it's it's a tough situation from a marketing standpoint, which is not the right way to put it, but I guess from a public information standpoint, on the heels of COVID, there's so much fatigue with dealing with public health crises, um, especially those of in terms of a virus. But What's your message just right out of the gate to anybody who says, ah, you know what, this is something the media is making up and it's just another way to try to get us to, um, you know, be under the the authority of the government? Because we're hearing that on a regular basis, at least in terms of feedback from people here in Rhode Island on, on, on my end, on the media side. Well, I think that's interesting. We here at Open Door Health are on the front lines. We are the state's first and only LGBTQ clinic. So we serve a lot of people who've been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. And um, and I would say that we, we have a lot of concern about our patients um, and we've diagnosed a lot of the cases uh, across the state. Um, so we think this is a, a real challenge. I will say that um, most cases around the country and the world of this particular outbreak have been concentrated among men who have sex with men. There have been a couple of other cases, about 2% um, uh, among other folks. But in general, this is something that is impacting our patient population. So we are concerned. Let's talk about vaccines right now. And and there was some new guidance released um, here in Rhode Island 
specifically as to who is eligible to receive vaccines. There's there's some media reports out there that, hey, the U.S. didn't act quickly enough to obtain vaccine from manufacturers and so on and so forth. Where do we stand right now in Rhode Island in terms of vaccines? Well, the good news is we just got a shipment from the federal government. Um, it's either yesterday or or today that it's coming in uh, in the state. I will say that globally, nationally, and in Rhode Island, there is currently insufficient vaccine supply. I think people are quick to blame the state about this, but we shouldn't be too hasty about that. This is an international and global problem um, in the United States and also in Rhode Island. And the dissemination of vaccine is being done by the federal government. Um, We believe that we have insufficient vaccine currently to vac to, to meet all of the demand across the U.S. and also in Rhode Island. I think the federal government and the state governor government are working diligently on it, but there is a vaccine shortage. Uh, at Open Door Health, we have been vaccinating folks for a couple of weeks in accordance with the CDC and state guidelines. Um, those were previously limited to people who had um, who are immuno, immunocompromised. Um, and that does make sense because they're particularly vulnerable. So we vaccinated a lot of our HIV positive patients, people with cancer or who are otherwise immunocompromised. Just yesterday, the state opened, uh, after receiving more vaccine, the state um, changed their guidelines to allow a lot more people to get vaccinated, including men who have sex with men who ha- who may have multiple sexual partners in the last month. So that's a real game changer because that allowed us to take the step to vaccinate um, a lot more people than we were able to vaccinate before. Um, We also received new vaccine shipment um, here at Open Door Health and the state also launched two vaccine clinics that will be happening on um, tomorrow and Saturday. So there's basically... You know, there's opportunities for people within those categories, if you will. What about the rest of the general public that may be concerned about this and and may cross into that um, those categories, but don't explicitly identify within those categories? Is there going to be do you have a sense of when there'll be more vaccine available? So I want to reassure everyone who is nervous um, that this is not something that we're seeing in the general population yet. One of the reasons it is important to address very aggressively now is to contain the viral spread. And we can't scientifically, you know, I'm a scientist by training, uh, public health scientist. We can't tell you scientifically exactly why it is disproportionately impacting men who have sex with men. Traditionally, this has been Um, a virus that was transmitted uh, in the general population, um, usually in Africa, um, from skin to skin contact. But this is so this is one reason why there we're facing kind of a public health conundrum is we don't understand exactly why it's impacting men who have sex with men. And so but what I can tell you from the scientific data is that 98 percent of the cases have been among men who have sex with men, and there's not really reason to believe that this is um, moving into the general um, uh, the general population yet. Um, so I, I think we don't have, and no cases have really been documented um, for people, uh, you know, sitting next to one another, for example, sitting next to someone on public transit, a plane, a train, a bus, Um, Usually this virus is transmitted um, with close skin to skin contact, extensive face to face respiratory um, exposure. So for long periods of time, you know, 30 minutes being close to someone face to face um, within very close proximity. So we don't think right now, based on the data that we have, that this is something that's going to affect the general populace. What have you seen in terms of outcomes? And it's it's obviously we've seen reports where people are saying, hey, look, this is a painful and somewhat long, I guess, 
a week or so or even two weeks of symptoms. But what have you seen on your end as far as here in Rhode Island? And, and you know, what, what can you offer in terms of what to expect if you are, if you do get well, monkeypox? Monkeypox usually presents with fever, lethargy, and headache is kind of the initial symptoms. Then um, usually with rash. And uh, for this particular outbreak, we're seeing a lot of folks with um, anogenital lesions that look like a rash that looks like pimples or pustules. Um, so those are the things um, to look for. I will say that most people are not experiencing severe illness. Um, so that's a good thing. N not too many people have been hospitalized here and elsewhere. But when people do get really sick, they often have sw swelling of the lymph nodes, um, intensive, painful skin lesions, inflammation of the eyes, lungs, brain, and secondary bacterial infections, you know, on the skin or in the lungs. So those are, would be considered severe complications, but they're pretty rare. Most of uh, our patients have recovered um, relatively quickly. I think one of the big challenges is that it is recommended that people isolate um, for two to four weeks, which is the amount of time it usually takes for the um, symptoms to abate. Um, and that can be really tough if people people can feel lonely, they'll be missing work or interactions with their family. And I think that is one of the things that hasn't been talked about a lot, but can be a real challenge. Yeah, that's pretty extreme. That's obviously more severe than COVID, even in, in terms of the average person. Um, is the state doing enough right now? We saw an, an announcement yesterday from from the governor's office in terms of addressing this. But is the state of Rhode Island specifically addressing this? Um, I mean, you're not going to see daily press conferences like we saw with COVID. But I mean, it, just in general, do you get a sense that the supports are there? Well, I was thrilled to see the governor's release, and we have been partnering with the state in a coordinated vaccine effort. We think that's important because there is so little product available and potentially not enough um, incoming. So we're thrilled that the state is responding now. And I think what's really important for our state policymakers is to make a whole lot of noise with the federal government because our vaccine our share of the federal vaccine pool was reduced this week and we need to know why. And uh, we need to make a lot of noise um, about it. Our neighboring states have gotten a lot more uh, a disproportionately higher share of the vaccine. And so in my mind, rather than look back, I think we should be looking forward to figure out how we can get more vaccine into arms here in Rhode Island. Anything else you want to share on that? I know we want to talk about, uh, you know, another program you have coming up later this month, but any other, I guess, updates that you want to push out there? Yeah, I think a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> at Open Door Health, people um, can come in and get tested. We can only test people for monkeypox if they have symptoms. And that's because we would have to um, swab one of the lesions. So people should not come in if they for testing if they don't have symptoms. The other thing is we can, people with known exposures, should be immediately vaccinated. If you get vaccinated within four days, it can, and you've had an exposure, it can dramatically reduce the chances that you get sick. Um, and even if you get vaccinated up to a week or 14 days after an exposure, it can reduce, uh, preliminary data suggests it can reduce the severity of the infection. So we wanna encourage people to come on in um, uh, um, if they're concerned. The other thing is people want need to know what this looks like. It looks like pimples or a rash. Sometimes it's confused with syphilis. It presents like syphilis or like chicken pox or herpes. Um, and so people who are concerned should Google it and, and see what it looks like. And if they have those kind of symptoms, we wanna encourage them to come in immediately uh, for an appointment with us. Now, if we run, we currently have vaccine on hand at Open Door Health, but if we run out, people can sign up online on our website, which is, they should sign up online anyway, which is www.odhpvd.org. 
And the last thing I'll just say is that we want to affirm the dignity of all persons, um, uh, including sexual and gender minorities. There's been overwhelming stigma attached to this uh, virus because of the way that it's transmitted. And we uh, affirm everyone's dignity and people will be received here with open arms, with no judgment. So we don't want anyone to have reservations about coming in for medical care. All right. So that's that right there. And definitely we'll, we'll keep in touch on any of the specifics that, you know, you want to push out there because it's obviously something we need to keep in the forefront here on in terms of the general public. Uh, Dr. Amy Nunn, Open Door Health. Let's talk about uh, another thing you have coming up later this month. I know Obviously, nutrition is something that's been one of your one of the programs you champion here, or one of the issues I should say you're championing. Tell us what you have going on later this month. So we are um, we are really excited that the state has um, uh, allocated about twelve million dollars for a program that doubles the value of SNAP when people buy fresh fruits and vegetables at the grocery store. Essential, what does that mean? Um, that means when people shop with their EBT card, um, uh, which is the, the federal program uh, to fight uh, food insecurity, that the value of their dollar will be doubled. So uh, a just to put it in context, if a cucumber costs $1, then they will get 50 cents back on their EBT card. And essentially what this is, it's a way to promote healthy eating among uh, people at the lower end of the income spectrum. So we're thrilled that to be partnering with the state on this program. And um, we're working um, closely with the Department of Health and Human Services um, to actually implement the program. The, the dollars were just appropriated and we're just now getting started. What what should people do if they if they want to learn about this program for themselves or anyone else? So they can learn about it on our website at riphi.org. They can go to the SNAP incentives page and learn learn about it. And the main thing is we hope that this program will be in grocery stores. So what people will be able to do and hopefully as early as, you know, the first quarter of 2023 is go into a grocery store, buy produce and essentially have it be subsidized by this program. This will make fresh produce available to people who might otherwise not be able to afford it. Last question on that, I guess, would be, there's also a lot of stigma associated with this. Um, it's, there's no question. Uh, you know, What's your message to anyone who says, hey, look, I, I'm just embarrassed to seek help, even if it means that you know, that's, it's a chance for them to sort of you know, get Get an, uh, get an opportunity to get out of the, the cycle of poverty. What's your message to them? Well, no one should be ashamed. You know, I think that programs that are designed to alleviate poverty, uh, other ones uh, are not so stigmatized because, for example, Social Security was started as a way to combat poverty among the elderly population. And it's not stigmatized at all because it's universally used by all. So there is no shame in having programs that help help people live um, healthier lives. Um, and we find that these uh, programs are really popular. People love them. Everyone wants to eat well. Um, and sometimes people just can't afford to. Dr. Amy Nunn, Open Door Health. This is Inside Public Health presented by Commonwealth Care Alliance, Rhode Island. Thanks for your time. Thank you.